And our next speaker is Dr. Suranga Dolamulle. He is Senior Research Fellow, University of York, and Director, Tertiary Care for Ministry of Health. I invite Dr. Suranga Dolamulle. Thank you, Dr. Shirani Chandrasiri, President, Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists. Today, my presentation is, is demand for power, antibiotic production in technologically developing world. There are so many definitions about science and technology. For me, in this presentation, I would like to elaborate technology as translating science to tangible outcomes. And the goal of the technology is to create products that solve problems and improve human life. I have got three quotations about medical supplies and technology. The first one is there are many areas and countries in the world in which the major need is for medical supplies rather than the technical service alone. The second quotation also more or less same. And it says that there are some countries possessing the necessary technical services, but unable to cope up with the many of their public health problems due to inadequate medical and sanitary supply. And the third one is the economic situation and lack of currency is necessary to pro procure supplies available only by imports. I have a question from this forum. Uh, can anybody guess when these quotations were made? Any guesses? When? 50 years ago. Uh, much closer, yeah. Yes, I think uh, it's really 72 years ago. I got these quotations uh, from WHO program and budget estimate for 1950. I think a very good guess. <laughs> So, I think uh, this kind of thing is still continuing. S so, my presentation is today is going to focus on the critical cause of the history of antibiotics in terms of manufacturing plants in technologically developing world in early antibiotics era. So, the early history is much different and the antibiotics Commercial production started in early 1940s, but uh, penicillin is considered to be the first antibiotic invented in 1928. Uh, during this time, the dis disease trends are much different. There's a lo lot of the infectious diseases due to two devastating uh, world wars. But we can't ignore about the, the better outcome of the infectious diseases due to introduction of vaccines, as well as the improvement of the sanitation in the society. So, during that time, there were many diseases which were really <coughs> came into the society with many complications like syphilis. So, the newly invented antibiotics were seen as a magic bullet for treating all these diseases for which they need to produce antibiotics. However, there's two different scenarios of the antibiotics production at the either side of the world, especially when the antibiotics production was thriving at the developing world, the developed world, the developing world is really suffering without antibiotics. However, formation and implementation of the some plants were assisted by the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. It is now dead and gone and WHO and UNICEF later on. I have few perspectives and interrelated things for this presentation, really. I would like to assess according to the political, technological, and economic as well as the socio-cultural and health perspective, as well as there are so many actors during that time, especially the international organization. They were supporting for the antibiotic production as a demand from the, the needy countries. And the big countries, the superpower, they had all this technology, but the technology transfer was not happening 
as expected. There are many challenges for the international organization. It really, from the external parties, they were pressurized uh, in terms of the demand in technology for antibiotics production. And even within the WHO, the certain groups like expert panel of WHO recommended to provide the expert training and literature for the antibiotic production for the uh, countries which need the large amount of antibiotics. So, Sri Lanka was the, one of the countries who flagged up this issue at the World Health Organization, our World Health Assembly in 1949, where S.W.R.D. Bandar Naika, the Minister of Health, became the Vice President of uh, World Health Assembly. So, he had a very mixed feeling about his country and the situation. So, he opened up his mouth with, although my country had been ranked rightly at the WHO program in malaria and tuberculosis, the country was suffering or hampered with insufficient equipment or quantities of DDT and antibiotics such as streptomycin. So those products are not available at the country. So he urged for facilitating and preparation of drugs in own country. Not in the own country, on the region as well. And necessary plan for the purpose, the necessary trained personnel for the antibiotics production. However, in this particular World Death Assembly had divided opinion. Dr. Vikram Singh, the acting director of Medical and Central Service of Sri Lanka, and Dr. Raja, the Director General of Health Service India, really demanding the medical supplies at a reasonable price, as well as the self-sufficiency and production of the antibiotics in their own country. However, Dr. W. P. Farad, the Secretary of the Committee, did not anticipate that same government on the steps necessary to make themselves in uh, self-sufficient regarding the medical supplies. And even the US delegate saw the medical supplies as an economic question. It is not a question of WHO. However, Sri Lanka and India, even the regional countries, attempted many times during this period to get down a penicillin plant to their region. They passed several resolutions at the regional committee level in India and even Sri Lanka, demanding self-sufficiency, uh, whereas the request supply of the specially arranged the drugs and the payment of the local currencies to the economic difficulties and due to the issues of the purchasing of antibiotics. WHO, meantime, in 1949 and 1950, uh, did a the need assessment according to countries' ability to apply scientific <coughs> discoveries and level of economic development and magnitude of the problem and industrial activity. And the expert committee on antibiotics in 1950 recommended for extensive training and scientific facilities and personnel for the antibiotics development and production in developing countries. The scientific knowledge was there, but the transfer was not that good. So there were many sort of demand for the new knowledge of the antibiotics during that time. We can't underestimate the advantage vested on the, the technologically advanced countries. They had a very big power on the demanding and supply of this antibiotics production. And especially the training of the scholars, they're really reluctant sometimes. Even provision of the most essential equipment, the, the picture so shows a uh, uh, penicillin extractor called podbilanclic extractor. Without that, nobody was able to produce economically sound penicillin. But it was obtainable only from US at, during that time, but they refused to grant export license for needy countries mentioning possible threat of developing biological weapons using this machine. 
However, it was really criticized at the various forum, but US did not change the attitude. However, antibiotic production started with UNICEF supply funds and WHO technical funds. And WHO started uh, a new section in, within the WHO for proposed antibiotics production work. Later on in 1953, it was transferred to another UN organization called the United Nations Technical Assistant Administration, ANTA, since the workload was so much. As Dr. Benaragami mentioned, there's a huge commercial interest for the antibiotic production. The most countries during that time were approached by the pharmaceutical industry to erection and installation of the antibiotic factories. The Egypt was uh, reached by the Danish company where India was to make an agreement with Merck and Pakistan government was approached by the firms from the US and the UK. The strength of the industry was so vast, whereas WHO was not geared with the most technical methods. So industry was in a position to <coughs> even bargain and request an engineering fees as well as royalty payment. With regard to the Indian penicillin plant, Indian government was about to pay very high amount of money as a royalty fee for Merck. And meantime, there was an economic assessment done by the WHO. One of the members was Professor E.B. Chan. He mentioned that the WHO supported uh, penicillin plant will be a good option for India rather than going ahead with the private firms. But this discussion really delayed the initiation of the antibiotics production plans for three years duration. The feasibility st study reveals that the target production was about 4.8 million mega units per year and total capital cost for about uh, 3.7 million, 3.75 million, and UNICEF allocation out of which was 875 million dollars. But important factor is not a, is a, it's not a, teen, a turnkey factor. There was a fullest participation of the local personnel. So it's a big advantage for India. The factory work started in 1952 and finished within four years time. And during that time, India made a lot of measures to discourage imports. The yield was so heavy, the, it's much bigger than the, uh, as expected, and it went up to 700 million units due to the rapid changing of technology. The economical assessment being done by the NL McPherson, he was the chief of industrial development section of United Nations. According to him, the net profit on capital investment was about 15 to 20 percent, and direct savings to the foreign exchange to India was 1.75 million dollars. However, the other side of the story is different. The price change in India for bulk penicillin was slightly higher than, so the purchasing from the orphan market appeared to be more cost effective than state production. But we can't forget about the advantage of getting knowledge and skills through this particular project from which India became the one of the pharmaceutical giant in this world. There are some more adverse effects from this pharmaceutical production and the plants. WHO noted that the production of the broad spectrum antibodies, which are not effective in leading infection disease such as treponema, but being double between five years time from 1955 and tendency also being continued. So there's a nice indication of the overproduction of the unnecessary antibiotics and maybe the overuse and misuse is which much, much, must have gone for antibiotic resistance. 
Now, when you talk about the constraints to the antibiotics production in Sri Lanka, since Sri Lanka did not have any sort of relevant expertise, only skills and monetary soundness, the, a, it's an inherent problem of the economy, as because of that, there's a big marketplace for US and UK goods as well as the expert and investors. Even Sri Lanka did not get any external organizational support for antibiotics production plan. Meantime, Sri Lanka had so much of difficulties buying medicine from the world market due to foreign currency exchange crisis. It was there in 1949, even 1958, I think even 2018 also we had a big foreign currency crisis where the, the buying power was not good at the world market. Anyhow, the initiation or installation of the pharmaceutical production in Sri Lanka really delayed for 40 years compared to the other counterparts in the region, India and Pakistan. Therefore, we had to think about the balance between that. So, if Sri Lanka got a penicillin production plant about 70 years back, the picture is much more difficult, different. We could have done the effective control of infectious diseases. We are really championing combating infectious diseases like malaria we have uh, eliminated. And there are other diseases also uh, in a good control. So we could have uh, reduced the disease burden much more better than this way. But there are another risk due to the continuous supply. There may be a risk of the overuse and the misuse of antibiotics. So. The current picture of the antimicrobial resistance may be different if we had a, a antibiotic production plan about 70 years back. That may be a missed opportunity, but we never know the outcome. Thank you very much. So if you have any questions, I can discuss with you. Uh, furthermore, I just want to thank you, uh, make uh, my appreciation for the, uh, the collaborators, especially the Elcome Trust, the main funder, and University of York and College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka and uh, Minister of Health, uh, Commonwealth Center of Digital Health, and finally the World Health Organization, Europe. Thank you very much.